The government's tight focus on the 20 to 30,000 children identified to be at risk of abuse or neglect is certainly fodder for the opposition parties. And Labour's social development spokesperson, Jacinda Ardern, has been blasting it across a broad front. She points to official statistics that show 67,000 children are living in high-risk households and up to one in four children are in medium to high-risk households. And she also points to the systemic problems that a range of state agencies handling confidential personal information have in keeping it to themselves. So what's Labour's approach? Selwyn Manning has been exploring the issues with Jacinda Ardern. Uh, Jacinda Ardern, welcome to the program. Thank you, pleasure to be here. Um, over the last week, you've been issuing statements saying that the Ministry of Social Development, but specifically uh, Work and Income New Zealand, has a systemic problem relating to people's private information. Mm. Um, what kind of systemic problem are you picking up here? Well, I think people will be familiar with the, the, the first incident that triggered all of this, and that was the work and income kiosks, which, as we all know now, had some failings in the systems which allowed members of the public to come in and access people's private information via their online system. Considerable breach. Yeah, absolutely yeah. significant. And one we know Work and Income knew about. Yes. But we've seen a second issue emerge, and it's not a new issue, but it has allowed us to air what is on an ongoing concern. And that is the systemic failure within Work and Income to protect people's private and personal information. Ongoing incidences of, for instance, people's benefit information being sent to other beneficiaries. Uh, information like medical certificates being lost and then being found to have been sent to other clients. Basic errors though that are though a real breach of people's individual personal privacy. So this sounds like for example somebody's got a you know one of the case workers has got a, a folder there a file of a particular person they may have another one here and they've got their papers mixed up. Um, is it that kind of thing? Is it a human error type of thing? It's a, it's a real mixture. Some of the incidents that I've seen uh, have have you know, been across the across the, the spectrum. Uh, people being given forms to sign and then realising it doesn't even relate to their case and it's got the debt information of another yes. client. Uh, a, a woman who walked into an office to try and get a printout of her benefit details for a rates rebate and was given the information of someone else going back five years. Yes, now, you, you made reference to that mm. in, in, a, in a statement and you, you're saying um, a, a sickness benefit um, was cancelled after work and income lost this particular person's medical certificate. Yeah. There's a serious thing for someone who's obviously on a sickness benefit. Absolutely. Um, then, then this gets posted, the medical certificate suddenly turns up, um, posted to him from another beneficiary. Yeah. And that's what you're talking about, yeah. this very, very deep and problematic kind of breach here. And advocacy groups for a, t a long time have been saying that one of the issues is that work and income are, do lose people's information. They are things that are important for them to prove their eligibility for government support. So things like medical certificates things that aren't easy to get uh, original copies of, and these are being uh, not only lost, uh, but in some cases sent to entirely different clients. Now that creates a complete inefficiency in the system. But one, one of the things that I was wanting to get an idea of is how is a person affected by the, these types mm. of things? If Work and Income New Zealand has, has lost a medical certificate, mm. and the person on the basis of that getting lost has, has the uh, sickness benefit cancelled. That's a serious, not only is it a, a problem relating to the way that the you know, mm. documents are handled, but it's a serious issue relating to the income of the person who has a legal right to that particular yeah, benefit. Absolutely, and it does have an effect. You know, the individual I was talking to yesterday who's, who, who had this particular circumstance, and I want to be clear that we aren't talking about these little one-off mm. incidents. These are indicative of wider systemic problems. Because you, you said early, uh, midway through last week, Mm -hmm. that there were 10 incidents that you had noted at the first um, instance. Then uh, a couple of days later you put out a statement, I think it was on the Thursday, that yeah. said we have more yeah. um, that you were detailing. Is this something that you were picking up that there's a momentum now, that yeah. people are starting to actually say, oh, hang on, actually I was mm. treated in this way and there seemed to be a problem. And interestingly, those original 10 were 10 that were reported. So those are ones that are in the public domain. And some of them include uh, work that Work and Income have done themselves to say, have we, which they did a, a while ago, now to say, oh, do we have a bit of a problem? They did an audit and found that they had to fire some of their staff for doing things like emailing uh, family members to tell them that someone they knew had come in to apply for a benefit. Mm. You know, basic breaches of a code that applies to work and income staffer. 
But since I've started talking about these breaches, I have had people contact me predominantly because they're frustrated that the minister has been so dismissive and has simply called it human error when their experience has told them that there are actually failings in some of the processes that have been used by Work and Income. Before we go into that, why do you feel that this is occurring, mm. and sidewinds in particular? Yeah, and I want to be really clear that for me this isn't about individual witch hunts uh, on behalf of people who in question may have been part of some of these incidences because I don't think that's fair. Uh, I do believe that this is a problem that goes beyond individuals and we've moved from human error to there being systemic problems around mm. some of the processes within work and income. And that's why we're calling on the government. She should be, the minister should be protecting her staff by making sure that we do have the processes in place that prevent human error from occurring. That's where in the, the governance place. comes in, you're arguing. That's where that's it's about governance. Bit. Now, it does seem at this, at this juncture in the interview, it comes down to one is this human error or is there a pattern that's, that um, uh, kind of elevates to a system, systemic problem? Now, the Prime Minister has waded in on this whole issue, obviously. Mm. Um, last week, he made comment to the media and he said this was just human error. He went further in the Fairfax media and saying, um, let's give the people at wins a bit of credit he says from time to time they can make human mistakes mm. now clearly the government led by the prime minister is taking a line that there is not a pattern here that mm. these problems in a big organization that is addressing the needs of thousands of people in new zealand that these types of human error are going to come through what do you say to that are yeah. you are you and secondly are you picking up a pattern mm. that co is contrary to what they're indicating I, I am but i one area where i will agree with the prime minister is that we do need uh, to recognise the incredibly difficult job that work and income staff members do, and they do it very well. That's why I'm so determined that we make sure that in order for the public's faith to be restored in work and income, to ensure that they are maintained as a credible organisation, that we do what we can to protect the staff who are working there. I don't think the Minister's doing that because if she were to dispel some of the fears that exist and the, some of the examples we've seen certainly point to there being a problem, she should be inquiring into it and seeing whether or not a few changes in the way that staff are having to operate might protect them better from some of the incidences that we've seen. If we're looking at why this is, has occurred, mm. um, Everybody that's watching this program will know that the national-led government embarked some time ago on slashing public service numbers. Big part of it, absolutely. Now, clearly, um, many administrative kind of roles within yep. the ministries have gone, Ministry of Social Development among them. Yep. Are we seeing a, a problem that is developing where frontline services and the handling of information are not getting the support, perhaps, by other administration kind of wings that once existed behind them? I'm certainly concerned that that's a big part of the issue. But that's only something that an inquiry would tell us. And that's one of the reasons I think we've seen resistance from Paula Bennett. So the process side of thing is, is one part of it, yeah. both in terms of the dealing of uh, handling of private information and, for instance, the use of databases. Whether or not we've got staff who are under extreme pressure and not adequately resourced is a secondary issue as well. well if, now, if we that, know, sorry, for instance, that IT staff numbers yes. have gone down by 70 yes. since the minister took office. Now, she cannot credibly stand up and say that had no impact unless she looks into it. Work and income yeah. staffers who are case managing files have uh, had their caseload increase dramatically since this minister came in as well. Now, she cannot tell me that that hasn't played a part in uh, pressure on frontline staff and potentially some of these errors being made. Because I was going to add there that people who are working in sidewinds are probably thinking, give, like the Prime Minister says, give them a break. They're probably saying, we're doing twice the work that it, we yeah. once did. You know, I'm, I'm receiving information from people myself just as in the, in the course of being a journalist that yeah. are saying, you know, it's not just the IT problems, it's not just yeah. um, forms going out wrong. You sit in sidewinds, you've got a security guard walking, up, pacing up and down behind you, and you can can hear the details of everyone around you yep. being discussed with whatever case officer is working yeah. with them at a particular thing. They're saying that there is a cultural problem. Yeah. Um, now, that's obviously something that the Minister Paula Bennett would refute. Mm. But how, how, what are you picking up yeah. that, that would be indicative, perhaps, 
that there is a cultural um, crisis that yeah. has been developing within the social development ministry. Well, first what I'd say is that that's almost an inevitability when you have caseload going from roughly what's meant to be around the 180 mark to well over 200 cases per person, per person. Yes. And we're expecting them to deliver um, really significant changes for individuals when yeah. they're dealing with 200 of them at any one time. So that's the okay, first well, point. What, what would Labor do about that? And the second point that I was just going to make on the cultural issue is leadership matters. Mm. And when you have a Minister of Social Development who herself has demonstrated a cavalier approach to people's private and personal information, then that surely has an effect. So if I Labor came in in 2014, yeah. for a start, you wouldn't mm. be breaching people's privacy, perhaps like the Minister um, was accused of by the Privacy Commissioner and, and uh, former Minister uh, of Health and Prime Minister yeah. Jenny Shipley back in the 90s uh, um, was accused of, and found to have been yeah. doing the same thing. So, But what would you do relating to women and the uh, Ministry of Social Development as far as perhaps if, if it is found yeah. and you do suspect that there are the numbers of staff have been cut yeah. beyond what can actually be tolerated. It's both cuts and it's caseload. So this is where I'd say that there is a much broader picture mm. here. You know, having a focus on picking up the pieces of people who are moving into the redundancy, who are losing their yeah. jobs, uh, that increases the workload on work and income. So a lot of this actually is about uh, the economy as well. And we so can't you would do it increase in isolation. numbers there? Well, first of all, you do focus on making sure that you've got an actual strategy for job creation and mm. sustainable job development. You know, that's a massive part of it. If I was looking specifically at work and income, culture matters, leadership matters, and how supported staff feel, that matters enormously. Because that doesn't cost much. I guess where I'm leading here is obviously with the tax um, uh, tiers that we have mm. in existence now, if you give commitments to increasing staff to a mm. level where they can deliver perhaps, yeah. well that's going to cost. Yeah. Um, well there's, there's a quid pro quo. If you, I mean if you've got a system in place where you're actually focused on job creation and job growth, we know our unemployment numbers um, diminish. Uh, we had 18,000 people on an unemployment benefit when Labor left office. It's now uh, at 58,000. So just by focusing on that end of things, we will ease the pressure on work and income. Specifically for work and income, we know we will save money for taxpayers if people aren't on government support, of course. That allows you to put a little more investment into your work and income staff so they can more intensively case manage. People who have been on government support for a longer period of time are going to require greater support, greater intervention. What work and income staffer can offer that at the moment when their caseload's well over 200 per staff member? Mm. So if we want to see really decent results, it will be about reducing that caseload so that we can uh, we can generate some uh, some d a real difference for the individuals, but also for the case. One, one of the things I'm picking up too is people are saying in the correspondence with us journalists is is that they don't know who they're going to be talking about next time no, they go into no. wins, that there is a waste of yeah. money there, that they used to have a case officer that would be yeah. put to them, and now every time they go in, they'll sit there for half an hour explaining their whole backstory yeah. once again. And it's, is, it is a waste of time. The minister changed the system. She decided that she wanted people to walk in and just deal with the next person who was available. Now, for some people, that might be okay. Mm. But when you have got someone with a complex set of issues, uh, having someone they're dealing with consistently actually makes sense. And so for some of those cases where you have got um, a range of issues that you're dealing with, they should be intensively case managed. And so I do think that we need to reverse uh, an element of that policy. It's just not, not working. Right, from the opposition benches, you're looking across at the minister. What do you think she should do right now to resolve the problem? That Stop is the denial. Stop the denial. Uh, we will only, I think, see a credible change in uh, both the culture and the support of working income staff if the minister acknowledges where the failings are and support her staff to improve them. Uh, but at the moment, her continual refusal to accept uh, a systemic issue, who blaming it on a human error, actually individualises the problem down to a, a handful of employees when actually it's much bigger than that. So a broad inquiry? I would like to see her broaden the inquiry she has into the kiosk situation. It needs to be independent and it needs to be fulsome. Jacinda Ardern, thank you very much. Thank you. So in Manning, talking with Labour's social development spokesperson Jacinda Ardern. Now, we've issued an invitation to Social Development Minister Paula Bennett to appear on the programme. In fact, we've asked Ms Bennett for an interview several times in recent weeks, and we'll advise you of progress. Meantime, that's all from us. We're back in a week with more newsmakers. Thanks for your company, and bye for now.
Supporting local content so you can see more New Zealand on air.